Why does Hollywood love fire? They go, ah, like that. <laughs> and it looks like they got shot through the eye. You're kind of scratching your head going, what happened here? Yeah. Hi, I'm Larry Zanoff, lead armor at Independent Studio Services. I'm Kelly DeVries, professor of history at Loyola University of Maryland. Today we're going to review arms and armor from film and TV. Both from a prop maker's perspective. And a historian's perspective. The Last Samurai. So the era we're talking about here is the middle of the 19th century. But the film is focused on this last group of holdouts that do not want to modernize in Japan, the, the, and they are the last samurai. It's unfortunate on this uh, on this attack that we don't see more of the bows, because I, thought, I really like that, the guy getting up and moving the bow up above his head. It was uh, the Japanese style of bows, uh, of archery, in order to get the fullness out of their longbows, and they're using longbows very similar to the English, which we'll see later, um, they would raise them above the head and shoot them in this direction. If we had had more of that, um, I would have loved that scene a little bit more. I mean, they bring in the crossbows and so forth. At that point, you know, if you've got a crossbow, you've got a firearm. Nobody's using yeah. crossbows um, at this time. Probably the most inaccurate thing in this whole scene is the, is the use of the ninjas. Nobody shows up in black costume at this time. Well, it's a movie about Japanese samurais. You gotta have ninjas. You gotta have ninjas. It. You know, but, you, yeah. you know, where where can we put them? Even if they weren't dressed in black, even if they were foreign mercenaries that come, the goal was to kill Katsumoto. Don't you think they would have shown up with a modern bolt action rifle that they have <laughs> yes, in the exactly. film? This, ladies and gentlemen, the 73 lever action. I've always found this this whole image of the ninja kind of fascinating because that image is the Hollywood image. Yes. The guy dressed all in black, he's this yes. special forces guy, and it's like, that's not what they were. That whole idea of them came, dressed in black came from like kabuki theater where the stagehands wear black and blend into the background <laughs> like the bunraku puppets where the puppeteers stand there he kind of disappears into the black background and that became kind of a version of invisibility which the yeah, ninja yeah, yeah. you know was supposed to be able to be so from a filmmaker's perspective you know there's a lot going on in this there's different tricks we use in the prop world rubber arrows rubber swords you know independent studio services where i work of course we had a huge amount to do with, with The Last Samurai. We did a lot of the manufacturing of the prop weapons and everything. I think we made over 600 rubber and aluminum blades for that movie. Some of them were half blades. Some of them are what we call a chest plate, where you actually have a metal plate under your clothing and there's only half of a blade and it sticks in there so it looks like you've been impaled. Some of them were front and back chest plates. So it looked like the katana went all the way through. Uh, you see uh, some classic gags, you know, you got someone hiding an arrow or a shuriken, you know, in their hand and then they go, ah, like that. And it looks like they got shot through the eye. You know, those are those are very old tricks, but they work, they mm. still work really, really well. You know, back in the movie Ron, Kurosawa, yeah, Kurosawa. in the movie Ron, when the hero is up in the tower and he shoots down at one of the guys who's attacking his aid, you can actually see the foam target under the clothing. Oh, no. That was a real bow and arrow that they actually <laughs> shot at someone's back. Oh. Nowadays, you can't no. do Curacao that. No, went for realism. So he, he did go yeah. for realism. Uh, but nowadays, through CGI special effects and kind of a combination of it all, you can get these blood effects, you know, kind of spurting out of nowhere. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. Robin Hood. Historically, this is the scene uh, where Richard the Lionheart died. That's where history stops. Uh, everything else in this is dreadful. Robin Hood here is shooting a longbow much earlier than they did in, in England, or uh, in great numbers in England. And the whole point of a longbow was that it could be pulled back to the cheek. That got four more inches in the arrow, 
gave that much more ballistic force to the arrow and that much more distance. And what do they do? And they pull it back to the chest. Why have a long bow? You can have just a short bow and you can pull it back to the chest and it'll have the same effect. The crossbows and bows are defending this castle and that's not bad. The bowmen are, however, aiming down. And once you do that with a crossbow, of course, the bolt's gonna fall right, fall right out. out. The yeah. crossbow bolt lies on top of the groove in the crossbow with the string behind it and it pushes it out. If that crossbow is turned up or down or on the side, that bolt is just gonna roll out. And finally, fire. Oh my, why does Hollywood love fire? You've got an arrow, it's so long. You put an incendiary at the end, you light it, now you pull it back at a bow. What's it doing in the meantime? It's burning the bow, it's burning the arrow, it's burning through everything. You stick a glob of flammable stuff on there, it changes the integrity of the arrow, and the entire bowman now has to deal with a different weight that he's not been trained on. He's got to shoot it off before his bow catches on fire. And um, changes the trajectory of the arrow. It changes as the well, trajectory right? of the arrow, yeah. Besides the fact they had no incendiaries in Europe at this time that would have worked. At some point in someone's mind, this seemed like a good idea. <laughs> These clips will smash through in the morning, take all the clutter. <laughs> it just, it's one of those things that just didn't happen <laughs> no. the way, you know, that they, they <laughs> wanted it to. And sometimes, you know, in filmmaking that happens, maybe the materials that were promised to you to be available there weren't available there. It's understandable sometimes to see, like, as you said, Ridley Scott, you know, how can you have perfect success, perfect success, perfect historical accuracy, and then you make this and you're kind of scratching your head going, what happened here? Yeah. Kill Bill. So this is the final scene that, that uh, Kill Bill won. Your instrument is quite impressive. We don't have any, you know, historical context, meaning we're not fighting back in the 19th century as the last samurai or in the ancient world. Here we get an example of, of the quality swords that were made throughout history. This is Hattori Hanzo steel. Usotsuke! Katana blades are made for slashing. Uh, they do have a point on them. They can be thrust. There's no question, and they're sharp enough that if they're thrust, they're going to go right through. It's going to go right through. But they, they're made for slashing. This film speaks to me personally also because I practice EI, which is Japanese samurai sword. So a lot of the elements that I see in here, you know, ring true to me. It's more Hollywood, but we've seen this in all of the, the sword films that we've been looking at. Swords, especially like the katana, you don't fight edge to edge. No. You would ruin the edge. Yes. The katana especially is, is a unique sword in that it can be used as a shield to deflect the other fighter's blade. And so you have a lot more of flat to flat on it when you're you know, kind of crossed with, with blades. To actually hit edge to edge like that, the blade could snap in half. Because Which it does in the, in the scenes preceding this. Of course. The there's a wonderful account of a Spanish fighter. He goes through this battle and he looks down on his sword and he, he describes it as a saw. Exactly. It has become a saw because they are using it. Edge they to are, edge. Edge to edge. So Oren's sword, of course, looks a little bit different than the bride's sword or, or actually different from any other sword in the film. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's in what we call Shirasaya. That's why there's no hilt on Oren's sword. The, the Japanese sword is, is a blade from tip to tang. It's, it's a blade. Everything else is just accoutrements. So you could change handles, you could change hilts on these. You knock out a central peg and you could disassemble or field strip your sword. And in order to store the sword and make it preserved for many years, they had wood scabbards and without the hilt on it, you could actually seal the blade in wood. That's one of the reasons we have many more samurai blades still in existence than Western blades because they rotted away in a scabbard of leather, you know, in some damp uh, climate, but not so in Japan. And so here maybe she's like, she's not expecting to use the sword. She's got her crazy 88, they defend her, she's yeah. got her bodyguards. The you know. sword is symbol at that point. Absolutely. Of course, the bride shows up and, and things kind of go downhill uh, from there, but the, the much more decorative effect, even on the scabbard, you can see the chrysanthemums and the, mm -hmm. the lacquer mm -hmm. work in Oren's 
blade, I think it shows that, that symbol, that status that you were talking about. And with the bride having a, a sword that she is expecting to use, of course, she's got a cross guard right. above that. Even in the West, we, we forget sometimes that those aren't there to stop blades coming down on the hands. Those are there to stop the hands going up Slipping the up on the blade, And yeah. uh, on the katana, that's very, very important. Uh, Western sword is a little less important. But it is still, it puts your hand at risk, it puts everything at risk. I think the fact that uh, that uh, Oranishi does not have that gives uh, credence to your point about the, that she doesn't expect to use it. Troy. We're dealing with the period of Greece and, and the Hittite history, uh, the, the epic battle of Troy, which may or may not have existed. I think the archaeology has now suggested that Troy was attacked. When he appears here, Brad Pitt is wearing this helmet that's anachronistic. Um, I'm not sure that I've ever seen anything like this, kind of like a pseudo-Corinthian helmet with, a, with your uh, plume put on top of it from uh, 300. And then he's wearing this form-fitting bronze, which doesn't protect anything. Um, except for his chest. It doesn't protect his neck. It doesn't protect his arms. He's got a shield which he promptly throws away. So he's running down there and he has no defense except for this mini skirt on. Uh, well, he's Brad Pitt. But he is Brad Pitt. Yeah. And he, he makes this odd jump and everybody is making this comment of, oh, well, that jump has to be inaccurate. Well, what he's trying to do is cut over the shield and still cut a vinyl organ. Now, I could have gone for the head, I suppose. So he's got no like helmet either, yeah, right? He's got no helmet. I'm not sure a big boy has many brains. But if he cuts down into the arm, the sword will go into and cut all those arteries and hit, enter the heart. Right. And so it's immediate death. And it was a very difficult maneuver in warfare. You couldn't do it with a whole line of people. But these individual combats, um, that I found to be quite stunning, but also very accurate. And our big boy there isn't really wearing any kind of armor. <laughs> no. So like you said, he could have gone for the head. I don't know that he needed to do that. Right. In later time periods, you, even when you were wearing armor, there's articulated joints, mm -hmm. there, there's mm -hmm. seams. That's where the term chink in my armor comes yeah. from, right? Yeah. And that's what you would aim for. Those were those weak spots yeah. under the armpit, down into the, into the shoulder. Because basically that's the front door going right down through your rib cage. So obviously, you know, Brad didn't really stab that guy, right? But I mean, in, in the scene, it looks like, you know, it swallows the entire blade. Obviously that, that had to be CGI, computer generated. In fact, he probably didn't even have a sword in his hand for most of those scenes. He may have just had the handle the hilt, yeah. and then through green screen processes, they would edit that in there so it looked like he had a sword. And of course, again, we do this in layers. He's gonna come running with a real sword right up so before he stabs him, yeah. then we're going to do the after effect. Then we're going to do that multiple, multiple times. So at some point, the blade went away. And then through the use of computer-generated imagery, miraculously, the blade's back in his hand again, <laughs> and it's got a full full blade. But that, that's the magic of the filmmaking art yeah. nowadays with what computers have allowed us to do. In the past, you, you wouldn't have been able to do a scene like that. That's where you see some of these bad catching a blade under the yeah, armpit. Yeah, yeah. And it just becomes one more trick in your bag of tricks to use for that specific scene. Because if you overdo it, it starts looking bad. Is there no one else? King Arthur. Arthur is probably the biggest hero in the Middle Ages, probably the biggest hero, maybe one of the biggest heroes that ever comes out of uh, literature. Arthur. Wherever I go on this wretched island, I hear your name. And yet, there's a question about whether an Arthur ever existed. We've got more different legends in the Middle Ages of Arthur. We have very different legends coming out of the Middle Ages of Arthur. Uh, this is Antoine Fuqua's uh, uh, version of Arthur. He's having a lot of fun with it. Does it match anything, any real Arthur? Not really. Probably not, but we're having fun.
And that's the idea of the film. The arms and armor, you know, they're all around. Uh, I'm sure the barbarians used all sorts of different weapons. Uh, uh, the Saxon armies always uh, use different weapons. The trebuchets, though, I love them. They're just really, really well made. Yeah, the one thing that you wouldn't use in a, in a trebuchet is a flaming ball. For um, sure. Because you, you're putting this flaming ball in a leather, uh, a leather pouch that you're using as a sling, and then you're winding up and pulling down, and that's letting that go. By that time, the whole leather sling's burned, and fire. your fireball yeah. is now burning your trebuchet. So nobody in the right mind would do that. They would have shot um, stones, and the reason for a trebuchet is not against people either. I mean, stone hits somebody, that would be nice, but it's only hitting one. In a siege, they're gonna sweep the, the men off the top, and then they're also going to throw into the town, terrorize the people in town. You know, from a filmmaking point of view in this scene, there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got fire arrows, we've got trebuchets thrown big fireballs. We've got horses. You know what? Horses don't like fire. And, and we've got live horses on set running in amongst the fire. Fire work is very dangerous and very technical. You gotta be careful about that. You'll notice when you have these big trenches of flame going through the scenes, the guys in the background, they're quite a distance from the fire. That's for safety reasons, obviously. Anytime you're using flaming gags in a film, it's, it's very, very tricky. It's very difficult to just create a flaming arrow. To shoot an arrow in the air and have it go through the air and not extinguish itself is, is a true skill. There's different dampeners that you can put ahead of the flame to kind of cut down the airflow. Uh, blades, you know, swords that have to be flaming swords. We'll build uh, gag swords that are actually hollow on the inside and have a bladder of some kind of flammable material in there. And then maybe we'll puncture the edge of the sword and it'll drip out in a controlled manner to keep the sword on fire. Anytime you can, in the filmmaking process, you can film something for real rather than having to add it in in CGI, it's better to do it for real. So if I can have them standing there holding a flaming sword, Let's film that, you know, as long as it can be done safely. Films and TV are always going to mix history and entertainment. Some do it very well and some not at all. Props are probably one of the most, if not the most important thing in a film. The actor interacting with the different props, you know, having to actually pull the string back on a bow and arrow. That one little bit of realism, the weight of a shield, that's the difference between what, what turns out to be a good movie and one that it's like, eh, that was okay, but I'm not gonna go see it again.